meditation. Judge George, I'll be up the offering meditation. Before I continue on, I do have one more announcement to make. And uh, this is, to add to the prayer list, the family of Wanda Brown. That is Kelly Brown's mother. She recently passed away, and there will be a funeral service at 3 p.m. today at Bevel Brothers. So the family of Wanda Brown, that's Kelly Brown's mother. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk a little bit for the next few minutes about the different seasons that we face in life. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but who here is guilty of saying, I just wish this season would end? I am tired of the cold weather. I am tired of the rain. I'm just ready for summertime. I'm ready for it all to change. Anybody, anybody said that? Just me, a few of you back there. Maybe you're thinking about season. You're not thinking about weather. You're thinking about sports. You know, you're in soccer season right now, and or you're in baseball season, or you're in track season, or you're, you're already starting to practice for basketball season. They've got open gym at the middle school. I know my daughter's been wanting to go to that. So it's like all these seasons just kind of come, and it seems like they're just, you know, this constant cycle of what we're going to get involved in next. When we face different seasons in our life, it can be difficult because change is often hard for all of us. I mean, nobody. I think adjust perfectly to change. <laughs> change can be very difficult for us. So uh, when we talk about these changing seasons, hopefully today we'll look at what Scripture has to say about how God can uh, work in the midst of each of those seasons and can actually bring His glory out of it. So I just want to ask, what's your favorite season? Think about throughout the year, what's your favorite season? Now they say... As Mike said, we only have two here in Kentucky. I've also heard it said that if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes and it'll be different. And I've seen that happen too. So what's your favorite season? Right before I came up, my daughter reminded me that, uh, that for the four of us, we all have different seasons that are our favorite. In fact, our birthdays are all in different seasons, and that tends to be our favorite season. For me, it's fall. But, uh, you know, there's all different things, good things for, both se for all the seasons. So what's your favorite? And why is it your favorite? Some thoughts about each season. When you think about the season of life we're into, just some key words to go through. The season of spring might be a season of beginning. It might be where you're planning new things in your life. You're envisioning something for the future. Or you're making a, a, an investment into something that will pay off later down the road. Maybe the, the season of summer is a time to nurture that vision to protect something, to manage or to endure the heat. Fall might be a time of harvest, a time of celebrating, of gathering together and receiving a reward. Winter often we think of as, as a time of ending. We can celebrate our successes, we can learn from our failures. It's a time of growing, a time of learning uh, once something has come to an end. So whatever key words stand out to you, just write those down. You have to write all those down in the bulletin. But what's something that stands out to you about each of those seasons? And how it makes it personal to you? Which season of your life has been your favorite? You thought about that? Are you currently in a season that you just absolutely love? That things are going great at work, great at home, there's new things happening, you're excited about opportunities that you have? Maybe right now is your favorite season of life. Or maybe you're looking forward to something. Maybe you're kind of waiting through your time now. You, you're, you're working your way up the ladder to success in your job. Or you're, you're waiting through that schooling because you know graduation is just coming around the corner. So you're looking forward to a season coming up that you think is going to be the best season of your life. Or maybe for a lot of us, that favorite season happened sometime in the past. And that season is something that we often think back to fondly. But if we're not careful, we can often live in that season and miss what God's doing today in our lives. So when's your favorite season of life? Maybe different parts of your life are in different seasons. Maybe you're in a different season with your job or with your family or with your, your, uh, your schooling. Maybe even a hobby, you know, something that's a different season. One's in its summer, one's in the winter. Well, it's important to remember that each season has a beginning, 
a middle, and an end. So wherever you find yourself, maybe you're right at the beginning of spring, and things are just starting to happen. Or maybe you're smack in the middle of summer, and it's hard, and you have to endure, you have to, to grin and bear it and push forward. Or maybe you're at the end of winter. Maybe you didn't, you didn't want to say goodbye to that season, but it's time to put it behind you, and it's time to move on. Whatever season you find yourself in, God has a purpose. He has a purpose for every single thing that we endure. And it's all too easy to miss those opportunities. Because we're either looking to the past, or we're looking forward to the future, and we miss out on what God's doing right now. So God is working, and He can work through your situation to bring Him glory, and we can learn to praise Him in the midst of whatever season we're in. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you open up every season, that you are in control of all things, and that we can seek you in the midst of our joyous times and our painful times, our times of waiting with anticipation, our times of recovery from tragic loss. God, you are there, and we trust you in the midst of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture we're going to look at this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. It'll also be on the screen if you want to follow along there. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a part of the Bible that we refer to as wisdom literature. And it starts with Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes. Now, if you remember, Solomon was the wisest king that ever lived, the wisest man outside of Jesus who lived on this earth because he prayed for that wisdom. God put him over his people. And instead of riches and glory and power, Solomon prayed that he would give him supernatural wisdom to govern and to lead. And God blessed him with that and so much more. But Solomon, unfortunately, made a lot of alliances with foreign nations and foreign gods. And he let the worship of idols creep into his lifestyle and he pursued other things in his life. And now when he's writing Ecclesiastes, he's an old man at the end of his life, looking back over what he's done, his successes and his failures, and he's learning from the mistakes that he's made. And Ecclesiastes honestly can be kind of a, a depressing book to read if you go through it. But the ending is good, because in the end, I'll give you this, Solomon says that all that matters is to fear the Lord and serve Him. If you do that, everything else falls in place. Serve the Lord, seek Him, fear Him, respect Him, be in awe of Him. So Solomon in this chapter, chapter 3, is doing what we call speculative wisdom. He's looking at things and observing the way things are in life, and he's gaining wisdom from them. As someone who spent much time running away from God, he has a lot to look over. Solomon is showing that a return to the Lord after a life that is hard lived even though much of it was wasted pursuing things that didn't really matter. But his story is a story for us today, too. That no matter where you've been, you can still return to the Lord. Let's, re let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It says, There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. There is a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now, this is a really famous passage of Scripture. And maybe if you've never even read Ecclesiastes before, you're familiar with this because there was a famous song back in the 60s that put these words to song. A song called Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds, written in 1965. And it goes through all the different seasons of life.
Solomon says there's a time for each and every one of these in your life. And so basically what I want us to get from reading this passage is that changing seasons are normal. Everybody goes through them. Everybody faces them. No season lasts forever. Changing seasons are normal. And as hard as change can be for some of us, it's good to know that ahead of time that you won't always be in the place that you are. Things will change. He goes on in Ecclesiastes. Let's just read verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. It's important to realize this is what we read this morning from Romans chapter 8, that in all things God works for the good for those who love Him, that God is working in each season to make it beautiful in His time. God's at work. You can trust that. You don't know what His end game is. You see, God is the artist, and He's got a masterpiece that He's painting in our world. Our universe is the canvas that He's painting on. And we are just tiny drops of paint that God is using to paint his big picture, his big redemption story. But we are a part of the masterpiece that he's creating. Continue on reading verse 14. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken away from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been. And whatever has been before, whatever will has been before. And God will call the past into account. God is doing all this so that you will fear Him. Now, what is this fear that we're talking about here? Are we talking about running and hiding and being terrified from God? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about being in awe being inspired, being captivated by the love, beauty, and power of our Creator. God is using this season to draw you near to Him. He's working in the midst of it. If you will just turn your eyes to Him, we talked about that a little bit last week, turn your eyes to Jesus and wherever you are, you will see that God is working to draw you into Him. He says that there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that has been before is coming around again. It says that God will call our past into our account. What does that mean? It means that the experiences that we're going through are not wasted. God doesn't want us just to ignore Him. God wants us to draw near to Him. wants us to seek Him in the midst of what we're going through. When we stand before Him on that judgment day, each one of us will have to give an account of what we did with the time we were given. And I believe that we will look back over our lives and we'll see the opportunities where God's hand was at work. And he's going to ask us, what did you do? Did you respond to me? Were you obedient to my call? Did you follow me? Did you seek me in your pain? Or did you turn away? Too many of us try to run and hide from our past. We think that it's too much for God to overlook and to forgive. Or when life gets hard, we shut down and we shut people out and we get angry and we turn away from God. We refuse to pray and we refuse to seek Him because we're mad at Him. But that's not the way God wants us to react. We're not meant to go through these difficult situations alone and we're not meant to turn away from Him. We're meant to turn to Him because He's drawing us near. And we're not simply meant to wait out our hard times. Think about that. Maybe you're in a season right now where you don't really like what's going on in your life. And you're looking forward to the day when that will change. But what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now to seek the Lord? What are you doing right now to find His glory in the midst of your pain? Now, see, difficult seasons in our life hold opportunities for ministry. Don't overlook them. We, we, seem, we seem to think that if we're going through a hard time, that God's punishing us. And if we're going through a great time, then God's rewarding us. And though that may be true, 
most of the time, God wants us to just praise Him and seek Him and trust Him. And even though something might be difficult, to find His glory in it. I want to share a passage of Scripture from Acts chapter 16. I'll give you a little summary of what's going on here. Paul and Silas are on their second missionary journey. And they have received a call from God to go to the area of Macedonia. And the city of Philippi is one of the chief cities there in Macedonia. And they have received this call from God. It's a vision that Paul had saw in a dream. So he knows that this is where God wants us, is to go to Philippi to preach the good news about Jesus Christ. And they go there, and they meet this lady Lydia, and they preach the gospel, and she becomes this convert to the Lord, and they, they welcome her, into the, she welcomes them into their house, their whole household gets saved, and they begin this amazing ministry in Philippi. In fact, they're going around, and this, there's this slave girl that is possessed by a demon, and she starts following Paul and Silas around, and she is shouting out, these men know the Lord. These men know Jesus. And she's harassing them. She's distracting from what they're trying to accomplish. So Paul turns around and he casts the demon out of this, this slave girl. And she's healed. She is restored to the way she should have been. And do you think people got excited? No, they didn't. They got angry because her owners now lost their source of income. And they got mad at Paul and Silas. And you know what they did? They stirred up a riot. And they got the whole town to come out and to beat and flog and to, to chase and to yell and to scream and to cause this huge scene because Paul and Silas were being obedient to the Lord and they were helping someone in the world. No good deed goes unpunished, right? And so Paul and Silas are arrested, thrown into prison, Locked in chains. Now the prison that they're in isn't just like you know the, the, the Hilton here. This is a place where they get three square meals or where they have you know, cable TV and, and, a, and a workout center where they can lift weights and stuff. Now this is an image of a Philippian prison. Now look inside what this prison looks like. This is the inside of that prison. There's no lights. There's no comforts. They are chained probably to another prisoner, maybe to a guard, maybe just to a rock, left there in the dark to rot. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Paul or Silas, I'm thinking, God, you told me to go here. I'm doing my best to serve you. And I get thrown in prison? What in the world is happening? I thought I was doing right. Why are you punishing me, God? That's all I would have that's not how Paul and Silas were at. No, they look for an opportunity to worship. Let's read Acts chapter 16. Verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God in the midst of the prison. And the other prisoners were there listening to them, and suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your entire household. The jailer, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And the hour of the night that the jailer took them and washed their wounds and immediately he and his whole household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Now that is a powerful story. Because Paul and Silas could have complained. They could have said, woe is me. They could have belly ached. They could have shut down. They could have been angry and bitter. Why did you put us here, Lord? They could have ignored all the opportunities they had, but instead they worshipped <laughs> And they took the opportunity to share the gospel with the very person 
who was hurting them. The jailer who locked them in chains, they are now preaching the good news to. And an entire family was saved because of it. When you face a difficult situation, a difficult season, look for the opportunities that God gives you. Opportunities to worship. Opportunities to grow in your faith. Opportunities to share your story and your struggle with someone else who might be struggling as well. Opportunities to tell other people about Jesus and simply an opportunity to worship Him no matter what. Because you never know when your season is going to change. The very next day, things were different for Paul and Silas. You never know when your season is going to change. Acts 16, 35 and 36. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers into the jail with this order, release these men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. The very next day, hours later, their season changed. <coughs> what would have happened if they would have been complaining? If they would have been angry at God, if they would have been running from Him, if they would have been bitter about their situation, do you think their, their season might have changed? Possibly. Do you think that a whole family would have been saved because they got to hear the gospel? No, I don't. Because they were obedient and faithful and they kept their eyes on the Lord when they were in a season they didn't want to be in. Don't waste your opportunity to serve the Lord. When you say, Scott, I just wish I wasn't going through this right now. I wish that things were different. I wish I didn't have to deal with what I'm dealing with right now. You don't know how hard this is for me. And if that's you this morning, I just want to say that I'm sorry and you are loved. And even though I might not know your specific situation, I've been through times where I thought, I wish I wasn't going through this right now. And the hope is still there. You can still trust in the Lord because He is working. One of my favorite movie quotes, book quotes of all time, is from the Lord of the Rings series. It's uh, from the very first book, The Fellowship of the Ring. And uh, I'll give you a little context here. Frodo, the hobbit, has been given the, the one ring of power. And it's causing him all this pain, suffering. It, it, it's killing him. And people are dying around him, and it's just this very, very difficult, dark season that Frodo is going through. And he says to Gandalf, he says, I wish that this need not have happened to me in my time. And this line that, that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, I just love. He says, so do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. We don't control the seasons. We don't know when things are going to change. We don't know what God's doing in the midst of it. But we do know that we have a responsibility as followers of Jesus to turn to Him. We control how we respond. God has a purpose for each season of your life. He is working in the midst of everything you're going through right now to draw you to Him. And if we can learn to seek Him and worship Him, then we can endure and we can see His glory in every season of our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes it's hard to see what you're doing, how you're you're leading and guiding. It's hard to praise you in the midst of difficult seasons. But God, I thank you for the words of Solomon and the example of Paul and Silas that we can turn our eyes to you and we can give you praise and we can trust that you know and you have a bigger picture and you're, you are painting that masterpiece. And God, we are honored to be a part of that. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your redemption story. 
And Lord, if there's anyone here today that's going through a difficult season that needs prayer, I pray that we as a church can lift them up. If there's anyone here that needs to know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would make that decision and return to you because you are working in their life to draw them close to you. And then we can remember that whatever season we face, whether it's a great season, or whether it's a, an okay season, or whether it's a difficult season, to seek you and to embrace where we are because that's where our, our opportunities are to minister and to serve. We praise you, thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name.